now is Vice President Pence's Chief of Staff and the President's former Legislative Director, Mark Short. Mr. Short, welcome back to Meet the Press. Chuck, thanks for having me back. Um, let me just start with a simple question. What, what, how does the West Wing want to see a, a Senate trial? What kind of trial does the West Wing want to see? Oh, Chuck, I think that right now the West Wing, the White House, is understanding that the reason this president's being impeached is because he's winning in so many ways. He won on taxes. The economy is booming. There's record low unemployment. The military is getting refunded. We're striking new trade deals. It goes back to what Al, Congressman Al Green said. He said, we have to impeach this president or else he could get reelected. So as we transition to the Senate, I think that we understand that uh, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer will strike a deal on this, but we do find... You're confident they're going to strike a deal? Yeah. What, what's, do you have an idea of what that deal is going to look are, like? Well, sure. I mean, I mean what, what is it going to look like? Chuck Schumer has said he wants a deal like the Clinton impeachment, and yet that was a vote that was 100 to 0, including mm -hmm. Chuck Schumer himself, voting for that deal that basically allowed a phase one to let both sides lay out their arguments and then have decisions whether or not they're witnesses. But it's a really untenable position, we think, for Speaker Pelosi to say, this president is such a clear and urgent danger mm -hmm. to, the, to the world, to the globe, that we have to basically trample his constitutional rights to force a quick impeachment and then say, well, we're going to hold up impeachment papers and articles of impeachment to send to the Senate. How can you possibly justify the contrast to say this is urgent to then say, well, we'll have to wait and see. So you want to see a trial start as soon as possible? I think Number the, one, right? Well, I think the president wants to prove his innocence. And so he's and he wants that. witnesses. I think the president has articulated he's open to witnesses, Chuck, but I think at the but same his time. his legal team doesn't. Is no, I think. fair to say or not? I think at the same time, the American people are tired of the sham. They're tired of this whole thing. And I think it, we're anxious to get back to the work for the American people. So, you know, to the extent that there's a prolonged trial, we're not anxious for that. We're anxious to say, let's get back to working for things the American people said they wanted. And Democrats in 2018, they campaigned on promises. They said, we'll work with this administration on immigration. We'll work with them on health care. We'll work with them to rebuild our schools and our roads. And none of that has happened. They, they seem to work with you on trade. They finally did, Chuck. But that trade deal was put on Nancy Pelosi's desk over a year ago. Over a year ago. And we know she held that out. She held that out to make sure her moderate stayed in line on impeachment. Let me go back. We did learn a, 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 a perhaps a new important piece of the timeline having to do with when the aid may have been held uh, with Ukraine. There's some FOIA requests that have surfaced, some emails, and I know you're aware of it this morning. And I know you guys have put out a statement, I think, about it. But I would try to understand it leaves the appearance that the administration has said that the decision to freeze the aid was known publicly July 18th within the White House at the budget office. This seems to indicate that a request was sent immediately to the Pentagon after the phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky on July 25th. Can you explain the disparity between the July 18th proclamation and what appears to be a July 25th email from a budget official to the Pentagon saying, make sure this freeze happens and, and, and by the way, keep this... Keep this on the down low. Let's step back for one second, Chuck. And remember that this administration is the one that has actually provided lethal aid to Ukraine. The previous administration sent bl blankets to Ukraine. The previous administration had Russia invade Ukraine. We're the ones that have actually stood up and defended Ukraine. So, yes, there was a delay. There's nothing new in these emails about the timing, truly, Chuck. There was a lot of emails and back and forth exchanges about timing of this. The aid was released. At best account, there was maybe 55 days in delay as we did our own review. If you think about it, in our budget request last year, we asked for $250 million of additional aid to Ukraine. While Democrats did this scam impeachment, they delayed aid for over three months. If they'd done their job on time, we would have had that aid September 30th. Is it make sense then to have Mick Mulvaney and his deputies testify, though, and give some clarity to this? You know, I think it's kind of ironic to be able to say that we have an airtight case. Nancy Pelosi said we have an airtight case. And yet she now says, we demand more witnesses. How do you reconcile those two statements? And so it, the reality is our administration is anxious to get back to working for the American people. We want to see a trial in the Senate because we want to see that the president gets exonerated. And then we're ready well, to get back to work. The best way to exonerate the president is to get, uh, if is you, to get Mick Mulvaney out there to, to, and then, to tell his side of the story, is it not? You've had a lot of witnesses. I mean, I'm just asking, already. is it not? We've, we've had a lot of witnesses already, Chuck. A lot of witnesses testify to what happened in the calls, what happened in mm -hmm. the vice president's meetings in Ukraine. A lot of witnesses have given a lot of different testimonies. You brought up the vice president. He, there was some, he had shown openness to declassifying his calls and the... Um, and from his top Russian uh, aide, um, the, the memos and, and her understanding of, of all of this, but you haven't done that yet. Why? 
Well, there's, there's two questions. One is declassifying a transcript, and one is declassifying a supplemental um, mm -hmm. uh, submission that she submitted. That supplemental submission, the House Intelligence Committee has. They shared the Judiciary Committee. It was included in the report. There's nothing that's being withheld, Chuck. And we had our own witnesses testify, Democrat witnesses testify, about the Vice President's call and about his meetings with Zelensky, in which they all testified that Burisma, the Biden's investigations, never came up. Okay. The whole conversation was about our commitment to Ukraine. What about the Vice President's uh, phone call? Because he was open to this. Is it somebody else that's saying don't do it? No, I think, I think we're still open to it, Chuck. I do think it sets a bad precedent for future leader calls when mm -hmm. they know that, hey, if I have a call with the President, the Vice President could get released. I think that's something sincere we haven't really looked at. But I think we remain open to doing that if the Senate makes a request. But what was happening in the House in their investigations, they said, you can't have counsel present. You can't provide your own witnesses. You can't see evidence. So why would we participate in such a kangaroo court when they had no concern about due process? Of course, now... Well, now, on the Senate side, don't you trust the Senate to now, have... I mean, so why, why, why are you... So, so what's wrong if having witnesses, having your defense, I the said Senate... We'll, yeah. I said we'll, we'll consider yeah. that, Chuck. Okay. I said we're open to consider that. But, but there, there is, again, this notion that's like we're going to absolutely deny the present administration its constitutional rights, mm -hmm. but now we want to dictate from Speaker Pelosi what the trial looks like in the Senate. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you were in the administration as the legislative director working in the West Wing. And there was a Washington Post story this week about that, uh, that talked about the president uh, was talking a lot about Ukraine in those first year in 2017, a lot in 2018. We put up one excerpt here from this Washington Post story from Thursday. One former senior White House official said Trump even stated so explicitly at one point saying he knew Ukraine was the real culprit because Putin told me. Did you ever hear the president talk about Never. Putin in Ukraine? Never, not once. I heard the president, what, what I heard the president say, mm -hmm. no relation to Putin in Ukraine. I heard the president say again and again a frustration that European allies weren't doing more. And it's the same guidance he gave to but the But you didn't hear the president blaming Ukraine for the stolen no. emails of the DNC? No. And what I heard the president say to the vice president was when you go to meet with Zelensky on my behalf, mm -hmm. keep in mind something that's not been reported here. That meeting happened on September 1st. The Democrat case has always been there was a quid pro quo and the money wouldn't be released until the meeting. That was the president's meeting that was scheduled on September 1st. Right. The aid was released on the 11th. The vice president After the went, whistleblower report. The vice president went on the president's behalf to mm -hmm. that meeting. He said, I want you to talk about why Europe isn't doing more and generally what they're doing to fight corruption. The vice president came home, reported and said, Zelensky's doing a lot to fight corruption. I think we should release the aid. And 10 days later, it was. Uh, before I let you go, I want to get you to respond to something um, from that editorial in Christianity Today. Um, and perhaps you have, you've talked to the vice president about it. I don't know. But I, I, this, this excerpt in particular. Consider what an unbelieving world will say if you continue to brush off Mr. Trump's immoral words and behavior in the cause of political expediency. If we don't reverse course now, will anyone take anything we say, referring to the evangelical community, about justice and righteousness with any seriousness for decades to come? Chuck, I think it's no surprise to you that evangelicals are not monolithic in their political viewpoints. But I think a lot of us who celebrate our Savior's birth this week, mm -hmm. we acknowledge that there's a president in this administration who is also protecting thousands of other unplanned pregnancies in defense of life. Is that Trump his behavior at it's, times? It's a president who's also standing for religious liberty. And, you know, this morning in churches all across our country, we'll be singing a little town of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And there's no president who has stood up for Israel like this president. And that gives a lot of comfort to Christians across our country. Even if his behavior sometimes isn't very Christian. As I said, Christians are not going to be monolithic in their political viewpoints. But there's a lot of us who look at what this administration has done and take great gratitude that he's our president. Mark Short, Chief of Staff to the Vice President. Thanks for coming on, sharing your views, and I hope you and your family have a Merry Christmas. Chuck, happy holidays. Thank you. Hello from Washington, I'm Chuck Todd, and thanks for checking out the Meet the Press channel on YouTube. Click on the button down here to subscribe and click over here to watch the latest interviews, highlights, and other digital exclusives.